We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance. So we're going to get into the word this morning. And as we track resurrection, uh, you know, Paul in Acts 17, when he was speaking at the Areopagus, and he, he went, you know, to, uh, you know uh, to their city, and he saw that they were very religious, and yet they were not worshiping God. He said, you are very religious people. You know, you can be very religious and miss the plot. Yeah? We can celebrate our feasts. We can celebrate our dogma. We can have our dogma. We can have our processes. But yet the true heart of what it's about is about communion with God and impact of society. Are you with me? Yeah? And we can miss out on the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has come to establish. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes, uh, a few preacher's minutes, um, just talking about the implications of resurrection and how you and I can benefit from the grace of God that has been made available to us in this season. Because the Bible says that Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. That needs to go beyond um, something that we celebrate and we're glad about to entering into the reality of it. Because when Christ was raised from the dead, everything changed. So if Christ's resurrection is my resurrection too, then everything must change in my life. In terms of my relationship with God, in terms of the way I evaluate myself in terms of my relationship with society. And I believe this morning as I was, you know, asking the Lord what he wanted me to, to talk about, you know, he began to highlight this to me, uh, which I believe is relevant for us today because we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, Father, we're so thankful that we can gather together in a country like this, in freedom, in the city, to worship your name. We're thankful for this house. We're thankful for this community. We're thankful, oh God, because in this place, your preceding word will always be experienced. Because you never leave us. You never forsake us. So, Father, we submit to the truth of your word this morning. We're not here to struggle with you. We're here to receive with meekness. The engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Holy Spirit, help us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. And I'll just read a passage. Um, I'll read verses 11 to 16. And then I will now take the verses step by step. Um, and, and read through the Passion Translation. So I'll read the New King James first, the whole thing, and then I'll take step by step through the Passion Translation. And I believe that we'll receive some wisdom here today. We're going to read verses 11 to 16 from the New King James, and then we'll read the Passion Translation. I read, it says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What for the need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing. Everyone say nothing. 
Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. Who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Everyone say the power of an endless life. Oh, say it again, the power of an endless life. You know, um, one of the things I've learned to do as a preacher is never to be confident. I ne I'm never confident when I speak on stage. Yeah? Um, and people wonder about that when I say that because I don't look it. Um, but I've learned that your greatest strength is when you're reliant on God and not on yourself. You know, I'm, I'm always very suspicious of people who feel like every, they have their act together. They can just wake me up. I can, you know, because you, 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 your strength is shown in your dependence on the Lord. You know, so when the Lord led me to this passage to preach on resurrection, I was like, uh, boss, what does this have to do with resurrection? <laughs> I need some insight. But, but we're going to take this step by step. And I'm going to read, let me, I'll read um, verse 11 from um, the New King James, and I'll read the rest from Passion. I will just unfold it, because I believe that there is insight for us. Verse 11 says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest, uh, that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You know, so the writer was making it clear now, you know, in the Old Testament, God had a priesthood, um, um, the Levitical priesthood, and then Jesus came, and there's a new priesthood, there's a new access to God, um, which he unfolds in, um, in later verses. But what I get from this particular verse is that sometimes God will establish things that are not his ultimate purpose. You know, when he was instituting the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood, God was very specific. He had detailed procedures concerning the construction of the Old Testament tabernacle. He was very detailed about um, the partitions that need to be built, the the tribe that will be the priests, the order um, in which they will serve. Everything was very detailed. He established detailed procedures. But the Bible says that, or we learn from this verse, that God can create a system of operation that is not his ultimate purpose. In other words, sometimes the Lord will lead you in directions that are not his ultimate purpose for your life. You see, many years ago, I learned an important lesson about the leading of the Lord and his purpose for your life. And this preacher was saying that, you know how it is said that the shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line. So we assume that if God is going to lead you, he's going to lead you via a straight line. But you will learn from experience that he never leads you by straight lines. He said that <clears throat> the leading of the Lord is more like a scavenger hunt. How many of you have ever been on a scavenger hunt? Or if you haven't been on one, you've played video games. Okay? And you know with video games... So a scavenger hunt is not about how quickly you get to the end of the journey. It is about whether you picked up all the different things you were meant to pick up along the way. Because they make sense later on, not when you are trying to transition from one phase to the other. I say scavenger hunts can be very frustrating because you'll see your friends whiz past you. Or should I say computer games can be very frustrating because they go from level one to level two to level three and you're like, you're still on level one and you know, you're getting all these extra lives. You're getting all this extra equipment. But you, they, your friends don't realize that they're going to need those lives in future. So sometimes the Lord will actually lead you in a direction that is not his ultimate purpose for your life. 
And that's why I say to people, never tell me who you are. Just tell me the part of yourself you have currently discovered. Because there's more about you than you have experienced. There is more about you than you know. You know, Brother Hagin was one of the, I mean, he was like a forerunner. He was like a, a major minister of the gospel. A lot of these guys that we all celebrate today are like great grandsons of Papa Hagin. You know, you see someone like Kenneth Copeland, you see Casey Price, and then the next generation of people, you know, and you, you're like, wow, they're all great grandchildren of Papa Hagin. You know, for about 15 years, I believe, of his life, the Lord led him to pastor a church. And he went from church to church, he was pastoring church to church, church to church. And then he entered into a season of fasting and prayer. And the Lord said, um, now I want you to start doing something else. I want you to start going around and having um, teaching um, sessions. And the Lord said something. The Lord said, now you are entering into the first phase of what I've called you to do. You, you know, when the Lord tells you something, and even though you respect him, you want to correct him. Know that that statement he made resonate. you know, it, it reached a certain part of your anatomy. So, so Brother Hagin said, uh, but Lord, I've been doing this for a while. The Lord said, yeah, yes, I know you have. And Lord, you know, you led me to, yeah, yes, I know I have. But, 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 but Kenneth, this is like a computer game. He didn't say that, but I'm just paraphrasing for the Lord. <laughs> yeah, he said you're not entering into the first phase of what I've called you to do. Because all of the thing you were doing beforehand was not disobedience. It was preparation for what I have for you. So sometimes... The Lord will lead you in a direction that is not his ultimate purpose for your life. So how do you discern which one is just something you're meant to do for the short term and which one is his ultimate purpose? You know, what I've found from experience that is that you really can't. Because when he's telling you the next thing to do, it's going to be like that is what he's about. All right? The Levitical priesthood, he didn't tell them anything was, he was, in fact, he said, okay, maybe I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But the only way you can make the transitions is just to obey him. Always obey what the Lord tells you to do. And don't be locked into the past revelation of God about yourself or about him that you have. Always obey what he tells you to do. And never be locked into the past revelation of him or of yourself that you have. That's the first lesson. Because he said if the Levitical priesthood was perfect, he would not have instituted a new one. But remember, he instituted something. He instituted it. He instituted something that was not perfect. But that was not the end. He was leading them somewhere. And when it came time to make transition, they had difficulty with it. Because it's like, but God. It can't be God because he led us here. So that's lesson number one. As we navigate the season, always obey what he tells you to do. You know, when um, Saul disobeyed God, and, you know, his final infraction that lost him the throne was when the Lord said he should, you know, he should go and destroy the Amalekites and destroy everyone. And he came back. And this is in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. You know, when uh, Samuel, he says, Samuel replied, and he says, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. Say to your neighbor, obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, sometimes we think we need understanding for obedience. Yeah? We think we need understanding for obedience. But 
Samuel said obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. You know, the way Paul, Saul responded to, to Samuel in the previous verses in verse 20, uh, Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. So as far as he was concerned, he had obeyed. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on, a, on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of things which should have been destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Now, the Lord told Saul to destroy everything, everybody, the sheep, the lamb, the goats, everyone. And Saul went, I need to track with me this morning. Saul went and he destroyed everything, but he didn't destroy the king. Yeah. And the people wanted the, the sheep and the oxen. And they said, well, you, we want to sacrifice to the Lord. Of course, it means, you know, you only do a tithe. So we'll sacrifice the Lord and keep some. So we're doing the right thing. And he said, okay, fine. And he came back thinking that they had obeyed the voice of the Lord. So it sounded like a very harsh judgment that Samuel was revealing. You see, what Saul did reveals something that we often do. Um, and if we're going to navigate the season, we need to correct ourselves. There are two things Saul did. Number one, he did not understand that obedience to the Lord can cause you to suffer loss. He's like, no, no, no. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. Why should I kill the king? The king is very beneficial to us. Yeah? Obedience to the Lord can cause you to suffer loss. You see, we have a theology that exalts our convenience beyond obedience to the Lord. Obedience to the Lord can cause you to suffer loss. That's number one. And number two, obedience to the Lord can cause you to displease people. Can cause you to what? Displease people. Displease people. You know, I said sometimes the Lord will lead you in a direction that is not his ultimate purpose for your life. The Lord will put a choice before you to suffer loss or to please me. You are going to have that confront you in your journey. To suffer loss or to please me. And the Lord will watch you make the decision. You see, you will suffer that loss initially. But the Lord is no debtor to any man. A debtor to any man. But while you are suffering the loss in obedience to him, he will allow you to suffer it. He will allow you to suffer it. Because he wants... He, he, the Lord tests us. He does. When the Lord said to Abraham, you see that your son? That your only son, the one I gave you, after a hundred years, I want you to take him to the mountain and sacrifice him. When he got to the bottom of the mountain, the Lord didn't say, okay, I was joking. No. The Lord stood and waited and watched. And Abraham carried his son and demonstrated faith in God. That You see this God, oh, I will obey you. He carried that precious thing that he had believed God for. That this thing is not going to become an idol for me. And he carried him and put the son on the... I mean, how do you put a 17-year-old boy? The 17-year-old boy must have trusted his dad. Because he would have said, okay, dad, I, I don't understand what's happening. Especially if I was raised in the States. I, I don't understand what's happening right now. But you've got to sort yourself out. You see, this is your religious fervor. I'm not doing this thing. 
Yeah? But the Lord waited until he lifted up his, and he was going to thrust his son's heart. And the Lord said, stop. Obedience to the Lord can cause you to suffer loss momentarily. And of course, it can cause you to displease the people. Because he assumed that if I'm doing the right thing, everyone should be pleased with me. And the people want it, so why not? Let's do it. And he lost his throne because of that. So the first thing we must do, if we're not going to be locked into um, um, old paradigms, is understanding that the Lord can lead us in directions that are not his ultimate purpose for our lives. And that means to make that transition effective, we need, to, we need to obey him. And also, don't be locked into a current definition of yourself. You know, in Proverbs 4.18, <clears throat> the Bible says that the lovers of God walk on the highway of light. And their way shines brighter and brighter. Everyone say brighter and brighter. Their way shines brighter and brighter until they bring forth the perfect day. There's another passage on this that I want to share before I go to the next verse. If you look at um, Psalms 32 verse 8. Okay, I don't know if it's coming up. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Psalm 32 verse 8 says, The Lord says, I will guide you. Along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. He says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Everyone say the best pathway for for my life. The best pathway for your life. It says, don't be like a mule or a horse that needs a bit or bridle to keep it under control. You see, why do horses, and I'm going to flip now and make it interactive, so I make sure you're all awake. Why do horses resist direction and they need a bit or bridle? Why do they resist direction? Feedback. Feedback. Why do you think horses resist direct? Don't worry, there's no, I'll say there are no wrong answers, but there are wrong answers, but just to make you feel okay about responding. Why do you think you ride a horse and, you know, someone's trying to guide it in a particular way and the horse tries to resist direction? Any offers? Pardon? It wants to go its own way. Yes, you want to say something? Distraction. And he feels that, no, this is a better way. Yeah? I mean, I could imagine a scenario where, you know, you're riding a war horse into battle. And he sees the guys on the other side. And these guys are not friendly. (laughs) Yeah? I I can imagine the horse thinking, you don't know what you're doing, master. I I think this is a better way. Okay? So a horse resists direction because it, um, it feels that there's a, is being led to go in a, in a direction that you'd rather not go. Okay? And you know, a horse has the power to push back and resist. Horses are very strong. So when you put a bit and a bridle in a horse, while they are resisting, you now exert more strength to get it going in the way you want it to go. Right? And the Lord says that's not how he wants to relate with us. He's not trying to look for, he's not looking for a, a bunch of people that he's just going to control. And yet, he's not going to remove your strength. He's going to give you or retain that ability that you have to use your will and go in the direction you want to go. And he's saying, I, I don't want, I'm not going to put a beaten bridle in you to control you, and I'm still going to allow you to have that strength. But what the Lord wants us to do, he wants us to submit our will to him, where we place our strength into his hand. And we trust him to lead us where he would want us to go, even though it may be unfamiliar to us. Are you with me? The Lord is going to lead you and I into unfamiliar terrain. He's going to let you know through the witness of his spirit in your heart 
that this is what I want you to do. He's going to give, retain within you the power to do what you choose. But he wants you to submit your strength to him and let him guide you into unfamiliar territory. You see, God has great plans for your life. He has great plans for your life. But where God wants to take you to, you can't even fathom it in your imagination. You can't fathom it. And you're going to be exposed to things that are unfamiliar to you. And I'm going to make you feel vulnerable. And feel, I wasn't, I wasn't trained for this. I don't have this expertise. He's going to open doors for you. And he's going to encourage you to walk through. And, and you will naturally want to draw back. Because, no, 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 this is not what I thought about myself. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have the other. And he's saying, trust me and let me guide you. Let me lead you. Obedience and not being locked into a previous revelation are vital. Because you may have done something for 15 years, for 20 years. And then he comes and says, okay. You begin to feel this unsettling in your heart. And he drops a new thought. And you say, Lord, that's not me. He says, that's not me. This is the season we're in. Because it's a season... Of promotion. Because it's a season of resurrection. It's a season of resurrection. Let's continue. So the first point was God sometimes establishes things he may eventually discard. Yeah. And move you on to something else. Look at verse 12. I'm reading um, Hebrews chapter 7. Verses 12 to 13 now. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It says, and furthermore, everyone say furthermore. For God to send a new and different rank of priest meant a new law will have to be instituted even to allow it. Yet the one these things all point to was from a different tribe and no one from that tribe. Everyone say no one. No one from that tribe ever officiated at God's altar. No one from that tribe. You know, to establish the new, the Lord may supersede the old which he established himself. Yeah, and and that was a point made earlier. To establish the new, he may supersede the old which he established himself. So we see that the Lord is establishing a new priesthood. Um, but it was going to come from, um, he had to put in new laws for that priesthood to even be legitimate because he had established laws in the past that disqualified that whole tribe um, from the priesthood. Look at um, Acts chapter 10. You're getting something from this this morning. Okay, that's good. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Because, you see, these are things that if we don't understand... Uh, we may get confused sometimes. Verse 9 of Acts 10 says, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, uh, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. Um, But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him. And let down on the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth. Wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, rise Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no Lord, for I have never eaten anything uncommon or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed you must not call common. And this was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself, what this vision, um, which he had seen, meant? I mean, was it bad pizza? I've not eaten. Maybe it's just hunger-induced hallucination. What is going on here? So while he was thinking about this, what does this mean? Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and they stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, 
Behold, or look, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Everyone say, I have sent them. Oh, say it again, I have sent them. You see, God was preparing Peter for transition. Everyone say, God is preparing you for transition. Oh, say to your neighbor. Say to the other neighbor, God is preparing you for transition. You see, so God showed Peter this vision. A vision is a picture, okay? And the Lord is going to give you visions through different things. What I'm saying to you now is painting a picture in your heart. Yeah? And it, is, it might be contending with an established picture you already have. Are you with me? But, but what the Lord does is when he's preparing you for transition, he, he starts giving you pictures. And in this picture, I mean, Peter was a devout Jew. He understood the law. And according to the law, there are clean beasts and there are unclean beasts. And every self, I mean, respecting Jew understood that. You don't need pigs. You don't need, you know, um, you know um, animals with hooves. You eat domesticated animals. Even if you are going to eat a bird, that bird can't be in the same vicinity as one of these four-footed beasts. You can't put them together. They have to be separated. He understood the law. He thought he understood everything about God. And the Lord is preparing him for something that he had already prepared. Through Peter's obedience, a new vista of life, an expansion of the kingdom, was going to be made available. So the Lord gave me a vision of... of these animals coming down. And the Lord said to Peter, arise, kill and what? And eat. And what was Peter's response? What was his response? No, Lord. No, Lord. Now, the word Lord, yeah, comes from the Greek word kurion. The one, I mean, at the time, only Caesar was called Kurian, Lord. Yeah, in, within Roman culture. The only, it's like deity. Somebody you never disobeyed. That's where Lord is. Now, Peter, a self-respecting Jew who understood the law, the Lord said to him, arise, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. Peter exalted his theology above the revelation of God. He, he exalted what he thought he knew about God above what God was telling him about himself. How often we do that as believers. God will never tell you this. God will never tell you that. And you know the Lord is patient with us. And the Lord did this three times. Because he understood where Peter was at. And he was helping Peter. And after the vision, Peter was still confused. Is it possible that the Lord will ask me to eat something that he has called unclean? Is it possible I know this was an illustrated sermon because there were people from Cornelius' house that the Lord has sent to Peter. According to Jewish law, you are not meant to eat with a Gentile. You are not meant to enter into a Gentile's house. As a Jew, as a... And you know, the Jews had two, they had several, but two key documents. They had the Torah, yeah, which is like the five books of Moses and the laws and the prophets and the, and the prophets and Psalms, they had, those were the, their Torah, really. The law and the prophets. But then they had the Talmud, which was the interpretation of the laws by Jewish um, rabbis. And the Talmud was about five times the size of the Torah. Do you understand? Because the, the, the Jewish, right, I mean, the Jewish um, um, teachers, yeah, helped interpret those laws 
And you know what? People are interpreting things. They put inadvertently. They add to it. Do you understand? So we say, come out from among them. Yeah? And we interpret it to mean don't even associate with them at all. Meanwhile, he's saying, don't allow yourself to be influenced by them. Are you with me? So there wasn't actually a, 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 a law in the Torah that said they should not interact. Because in God's dealings <laughs> with them, there had always been those interactions. But the Talmud, they had these Jewish laws that they thought was an interpretation of what God would do or what God wanted. And they added and added and added to these things. So Peter was exalting his theology above the revelation of God. Above the revelation of God. God was calling these things clean, even though they had previously been called unclean. Previously been called unclean. You know, I forget the exact quote now. But an ex-president of Sweden who was a, who was a Christian, he said there is no dimension of life in which Christ, who is the only sovereign Lord, does not point to and say it's mine. There is no dimension of life that Christ doesn't say that belongs to me. You know, the church has said certain things do not belong to us. Politics is dirty. Oil and gas, don't touch it. Yeah? Education is not going anywhere. Are you with me? There is no dimension of life that Jesus hasn't said that belongs to me. Salvation is not just personal. Salvation is institutional. The reason why we have not made the kind of impact we're meant, we meant to make is because we thought revival was just personal. It never impacted institutions. So at best, we have a, a bunch of people that are giving their lives to Christ, and thank God we have more people going to heaven. But we do not touch the institutions that govern them. So give it 20 years. The guys that control the institutions will ensure that those Christians are going to have a very, very hard time living. So the Lord said to Peter, don't call what I call clean unclean. Don't call what I call clean unclean. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 of Hebrews 7. And these are things that, that we need to allow to sit in our hearts. Because, you know, sometimes there's a contention between our Christianity or our brand of Christianity and, um, and what we feel is good for our lives. I, I, I'm not saying that very well, but, you know... Really, it's, also, it's almost like how for many years, um, you know, um, scientists had an issue with Christians because they felt that Christians were not enlightened. So things that were scientific fact, Christians would say, no, it's not true because the Bible says this. But in fact, true science and the revelation of God are always aligned. True science, that is. Yeah, because everything reveals God's goodness. But the issues that we have had contention has not been Christianity, has been religion. You understand? We're too religious. We're too religious. So we miss out the heart of God when it comes to humanity. Our religion confines us. Our religion constricts us. And when I say religion, I don't mean the true revelation of God. I mean wrong interpretation of scripture and God's priority in redeeming humanity. So sometimes there's this conflict that doesn't need to be there. Look at verse 14. Of Hebrews 7. It says, For we all know that our Lord didn't descend from the tribe of Levi, but shined from the tribe of Judah. And Moses himself never said anything of a priest in connection with Judah's tribe. You see, Moses, who gave them the law, never said anything concerning Judah's tribe in terms of the priesthood. In fact, you have verses like uh, Deuteronomy 8.15, where the Lord said that the tribe of Levi, out of your tribe, will minister to the Lord forever. Moses never said anything about something coming from the tribe of Levi or a priest coming from the tribe of Levi. 
You see, sometimes God hides things concerning your life within himself. And he will only reveal those things at a future time. He will reveal things to you on a need-to-know basis. Everyone say need-to-know basis. Or say it again, need-to-know basis. And you see, that revelation will always surprise you. You know, imagine God planning to, at some point, change the priesthood from the house of Levi. You would think that this was pretty, this was pretty important information. When he was starting off and saying, Aaron and your tribe are going to be my priests for all time. Yeah? It would, you would consider it pretty important to have that caveat in there. Like, until the time where I changed my mind. He didn't say that at that point. Yeah? He said, because the secret things belong to the Lord our God. The things that are revealed belong to our children. So, when it's time of revelation, you will know. He doesn't tell you everything. He doesn't tell you everything. He doesn't tell you everything. So don't lock yourself into a previous definition of yourself, even though God revealed it at the time. Because you are in progress. Everyone say, I'm in progress. And you will receive constant surprises. I used to make this joke that, you know, I'm like Microsoft, expect updates every few minutes. But I think Microsoft is a lot more stable now, right? Even though during, during that period of constant updates, I just left Microsoft and moved to Apple. And Apple is... Um, is like the difference between heaven and hell. I mean. <laughs> but the Lord, um, the Lord will surprise you. The Lord will surprise you. You'll think you've come to retirement. And he'll say, now you are entering into the first phase. I just, got, Moses was 80. When the Lord came and said, yes, now you're ready. And the next 40 years was more productive than the previous 80. Sometimes when you want to shoot an arrow really far, you draw the bow. You draw it real, it's like, instead of moving forward, you're pulling it back, pulling it back. But no, I want to go, I want to go. It's just pulling back, I'm pulling back. Because when he shoots you, you will go much faster than you ever imagined. So don't assume. Don't assume. We say we make those internal assumptions. I say these assumptions are, are so uh, ingrained so that when he begins to talk to us, we resist it. Do you know? We say, no, Lord. I mean, how can? No, it can't be. It can't be. It can't be. It can't be. This is not who I am. This is not my personality. My personality doesn't fit this. Everybody God ever met said that. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Everybody. And in our minds, we agree it's in the Bible, but when he's saying it in your life and saying, this is a time of resurrection, and it begins to drop things, and you're like, no, it can't be, no, no, oh, don't you know who I am? No, no. The Lord never said there will ever be a priest from a tribe other than Levi. Never revealed that, even to Moses. You see, he has a, Moses, <laughs> you know, there's some people that in the Bible, you know, God was calling names. He said, even if these guys come and talk to me, I'll say no, because these guys have a different status. He said, even Job, if Noah comes, if Moses comes to, I will not say. So there are people, so when people say Moses, I mean, Moses would have known. He said, even God, God did not reveal it even to Moses. There are things about your life that he hides. He will hide it from everybody, including you. But when it's time, he begins to reveal it. He begins to reveal it. We're getting to the end of this. We're going to verse 16. But verse 14. Oh, no, I've, I've, read, I've read 14. So let's read verses 15 and 16. So basically, God had to change the law. He had to change the law to... Make room for another tribe. <laughs> yeah. So he superseded the law he had already established. God can do that. He can change things around. 
Don't say it can never come from, it can't come from the tribe of Judah because he had already said, no, it's okay, we can supersede it. A new law, have we? Yeah? When they say that rotation is in this direction, he can supersede it. It's a new law. Verses 15 and 16, I bring this to a close. It says, and all this is made even clearer. If there was another king priest raised with the rank of Melchizedek, this king priest did not arise because of a genealogical right under the law to be a priest. But the way this king priest arose was by the power of, of an indestructible, the Passion Translation says, by the power of an indestructible resurrection life. This thing was established. The establishment of a new priesthood. The establishment of this elevation to a new rank came by the release of resurrection life. Resurrection life. Resurrection life. And that's why when we are talking about resurrection, which we are celebrating today as Christians, we need to take an x-ray of it and see how it happened to Jesus because how it happened to Jesus is how it's going to happen to you. Are you with me? There is a release of resurrection life that will change destinies. It will establish new laws. It will uproot you from a structure that had held you down and defined you for decades. And it will lift you up and plant you into a different place. Resurrection life. Resurrection life. And that is the season we're in. That's the season we're in. You know, in Psalm 16 verse 8, the Lord gave David insights into what was happening in hell when Jesus was there. You know, we said Jesus died for three days and three nights. Well, it felt like that in time. But hell is not in time. They don't count hours in hell. It's eternity. So this is what you're saying, that Jesus died on Good Friday and rose on Easter Sunday. It's like, oh. Three days and three nights he arose. Understand that the dimension he was in could have been, it, could have, it would have felt like eternity. Because there's no time there. There's no time there. But the Lord gave David insight into, the Father gave David insight into what the Lord went through. Look, let's look at that real quick. And I am bringing this to a close. He said, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. And I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Everyone say, my flesh will rest in hope. <laughs> For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know, there's waiting on God, and there's waiting for God. There's waiting for God. You know, when we talk about waiting on God, we're just talking about, you know, um, um, you know fellowship with the word, staying in that place of faith and confidence, which is great, and, and it's true and right, and we emphasize that a lot here. But there's also waiting for God. There are certain things that have to do with timings and seasons of our lives, right? Um, but you see, when, when Jesus was in hell, the Bible says his flesh rested in hope. He had a confidence in God that the Lord will not leave his soul in hell or allow his Holy One to see corruption. So he was in a, in a posture of faith and expectancy, yeah? There are certain things that you cannot do for yourself. There are certain things that only God can do for you, yeah? That only God can do for you. And resurrection is one of those things. But our posture must be a posture of rest and hope. The Bible says that if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead will quicken. He will give life to you, your mortal body, by his spirit 
that dwells in you. You know, I come to announce today by the Holy Spirit that we're in a season of resurrection life. Don't believe what you have said about yourself based on your history, based on how you have interpreted what you have read. New books have been written about you. Old laws have been superseded. The one who created you is revealing new things about you. And he will effect them through the release of resurrection life. Nothing can stop you now because res resurrection has come. You know, I, I, as I was preparing this, the image the Lord gave me. I know the Lord operates in images. He will give you pictures. The image the Lord gave me was like a rocket that's been launched. Have you ever watched? I mean, I don't know. I know it's not. I mean, I was going to say Cape Canaveral. That dates me, right? Because now it's happening everywhere. You know, everyone is launching the rocket. But, but, but you see this situation where you, there's this huge rocket weighing tons and tons. And then when they initiate, I mean, the launch... The kind of power that's released from that rocket will overcome every inertia, does it not? Because the power that is being released, the kind of power that raised Christ from the dead, overcame every restriction, every law, everything that had been said and thought, all of what hell had orchestrated. When the Spirit of God stepped into hell and the power of God was released, there was no impediment to the speed of resurrection. And there will be no impediment to the speed of your resurrection. If you will only begin to believe what God is saying about you. There's a big if there. There's a big if there. If you would only begin to believe what God is saying about you. If you begin to believe. You know you can tell what somebody believes. By how they act. You know Jesus in hell. In the realm of eternity. The Bible says that his flesh was resting in hope and his heart was glad and his, in glory he was rejoicing. Where is he? He's in hell. But his heart was glad. His flesh was resting in hope. You can always tell what someone believes. If you believe that God is, is leading you to create a new business and you're beginning to embrace that, the quality of preparation will tell us what you believe. Are you with me? The, the quality of your preparation. You know, some people are just like, okay, let God do it for me. No, you don't believe it. You don't believe it. There are some people that want to wait until the door opens for them to prepare. Yeah? That means you don't believe it. Because the action you are taking in hell will tell us what you believe. You know, when God changed Abraham's name to Abraham, the Bible says that he began to give glory to God, even though he didn't have a child yet. Our current definition of faith is he will wait until the child is born and then say, oh, my name is Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. Do you understand? On the inside, it wasn't even about what he was saying. On the inside, he was already rejoicing. This is who I am. He was already walking around. Okay, let's get the, let's get the, the room ready. Yeah? All right, Sarah, wear some makeup so that I can... Be attracted to, you know, at least do the needful. Do you understand? Because we're having a child. Let's start preparing, getting ready. Are you with me? If we will begin to believe, one of us, maybe two. You guys do not understand. I have attended Kenneth Copeland meetings where he starts in the morning and ends in the evening. <laughs> And you just get on and start. I was like, well, if I, um, if I had the time to, 
I respect you by studying the word and giving you the word that's going to change your life. You need to respect me by paying attention. And he would just start. You get through lunch. It's like, you think you're the only one who wants to eat? Me, I'm saying, do, do I not look like someone that needs to not this food? <laughs> oh, man, we're almost done. First Corinthians 15. You see, these are, what I'm saying is not just for here. Because I need to say it so that we can take it with us and listen over and over again. Because it will change your life and mine. The Lord does not cast his pearls before swine. The Lord does not throw holy things to dogs. Yeah? Jesus said the Father loves the Son and shows him all things he's doing. The love of the Father is going to be demonstrated to you by him giving you insight into things. That's how he demonstrates his love. By beginning to give new thoughts into your heart. Because as you engage with those thoughts, it will be a catalyst for your transformation. When the door opens, you'll be ready. Because grace is opening doors in this time. And it is faith that causes us to step in. But faith doesn't come out of the air. Faith is strengthened by the word. It's given confidence by the word. So when you receive the call, Preparation will meet opportunity. When they examine the work of your hand when you're in hell, everyone will look at it and say, look at the quality of this. Who is that guy? Saul said. When David, who was unknown, killed Goliath because he was prepared and he had submitted to the preparation of God. He didn't know where God was taking him. He just only knew was to prepare. And when the time came, he was the only one with courage and strength. To do the impossible. And it caused Saul to say, who is that guy? What is the quality of your hand showing about your faith in God? It's not just favor. It's not just favor. Favor will cause the Lord to cause people to look at the work of your hands. Because the Lord is more interested in the progress of this nation than in you coming out to give a testimony that God has blessed me. So if he has given you opportunity to prepare, and you don't prepare, the favor is not going to look in your direction. You think it's only about your life that the Lord is interested? Do you not know that there are millions of people that are crying out to God and God is listening and is looking for a man that is after his heart, that has submitted to God and allowed God to frame his character. That is who God is looking for. And it will turn people's hearts. It does not matter what they have orchestrated. He will set it up such that that one is getting in there. Are you with me? If only we would... Believe what God is telling us to do and respond accordingly. Two verses. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42, I read the Passion Translation. Just two more thoughts, yes. It says, and that's how it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in decay, but it will rise in immortality. It is sown in humiliation. But it will be raised in glorification. It will be sown in weakness. <laughs> but it will be raised in power. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. It's written the first Adam, or first man Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became the life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual did not come first. The natural pre precedes the spiritual. The first man was from the dust of the earth. The second man is the Lord, of, Lord Jehovah from the realm of heaven. You see, don't project the quality of the resurrection by the quality of what is sown. You see, there's a dimension to this where we say that what you sow is what you reap, which is true. But you know, where God is taking you to is so different from where you are right now. You plus resurrection life is very different from what you have ever experienced before. He said one is sown a physical thing and it comes out a supernatural thing. Do you understand? It's not just going to be an improved version of what you are right now. When the resurrection life comes, it's going to put you in a place that is not commensurate with where you currently are. Does that make sense? Because the product of resurrection far, out, um, far 
surpasses what, um, what um, it looks like. So don't project the quality of the resurrection from the quality of what is sown. Let us have faith in the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. The best companies are yet to be built. The best technologies are yet to be invented. The greatest educational systems that are going to educate millions and millions of people are yet to be conceived of. Yeah? There's a dimension of life that we haven't even touched. You know, the way the internet transformed humanity. Yeah? There are dimensions that we have not even touched. Okay? This one they were saying, oh, the evil, the this, the that is already taken over. Well, there's a, just, there's a new door that's going to open and it's going to level the playing field. And those who are prepared will be projected. This thing is going to change. Yeah? It's going to change. It's going to change. But we get to determine the kind of resurrection we experience. Yeah? We get to determine the kind of resurrection that we experience. You know, last verse, Hebrews 11.32, we're not talking about faith. And you know, I've been talking about faith for a while. And the word. Talking about faith and the word. Faith and the word. These are very practical things. In Hebrews 11.32, you know, the writer had spent a lot of time talking about faith. And we're going to keep talking about faith. But he ends by saying, and what more can I say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. Also David and Samuel and the prophets. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. Through faith, they worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouth of lions. They quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead race to life again. Others being tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. A better resurrection. Don't thwart the quality of the resurrection that the Lord has intended for you by limiting your life by your past experiences, by your present circumstances, by the present laws, by your interpretation of past laws that have been said about you or they are saying, there is a power that's being released in your life, resurrection power. That will overcome every plan of man and Satan to hold you down. And it's powerful enough to launch you, according to God's purpose, into outer space. That's why he kept talking about faith. These guys, through faith, embraced a better resurrection. Through faith that comes from strength and confidence in God. That comes from not limiting ourselves by our past. By not allowing our current theology to define our future but embraces God and God alone and what he says about you alone. That is the kind of faith that makes room for resurrection power. That would actually make a difference in our lives. We are the rain.